welcome to their Alto Trading Live Strategy Session with Jeff Tompkins. This is your host, Richard Van Rich, and we have Craig Ward with us here tonight in the chat. We have a lot of great information to go with you guys tonight. We're really excited to have you all on with us. If this is your first time on, you'll notice that your microphones are muted. That's how we can hear Jeff and I talk. Uh, but there is a Q&A box and a chat box located at the bottom of your screen. So if you move your cursor around, you used to see it, put them in there, and we'll get to those throughout the evening and also before we sign off. If you do have to hop off for any reason, don't worry, this is recorded and be available in the members area later tonight and sometime on YouTube tomorrow. You can go to at Altos Trading to find our YouTube page. And for watching us on YouTube, like and subscribe. And you can uh, watch some of our future videos as we post those periodically. If you have any questions about your account access to Trade Transilian, Open Trade Alerts, uh, anything like that, email support at altostrading.com and we'll get to those specifically for you tomorrow. Um, and hold the questions for trading tonight. So before I bring on Jeff, let me read the disclaimer. Altos Trading LLC and Trade Transilian software is intended to be used as an information service for subscribers, and it includes opinions as to buying, selling, and holding various stocks and securities. However, publishers of Altos Trading Trade Transilian software are not brokers or investment advisors and do not provide investment advice or recommendations directly to any particular subscriber or in view of the particular circumstances of any particular person. Altos Trading LLC, including its owners, do not accept responsibility for any decisions made by subscribers using the software. And subscribers to the Trade Transilian software, any of the persons who buy, sell, or hold security should do so with caution. They consult with a broker or investment advisor before doing so. So that being said, let me give the microphone to Jeff if you want to grab it. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. <laughs> How you doing? Good, good. I'm not sure if you're laughing at me or... No, I'm, my wife and daughter are downstairs like doing karaoke, and I, I don't know if you guys can pick it up. <laughs> Sorry. That's hilarious. Well, no, nah, I can't hear it. I wish I could. Probably our, <laughs> so do our viewers. <laughs> Sounds like the voice. More, yeah, more more entertaining. Speaking of the voice, I've I, uh, they've had a lot of commercials that uh what is it? Uh Blake Shelton last season. Yeah, he's leaving. Leaving the show. I guess he's yeah. second winning. Yeah, he like wins like every time. Right. It's better to go out on a high note, I guess. Yeah. So All I, right. I want to have like a big monster trade at like 97 years old. Just yeah, there you go. Get a big mother load and just tap out. Yeah. Go big or go home. It's a way to go. Then you'll end up living to like 110. <laughs> no, right. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Welcome, everybody. Great to have you guys here. As, uh, you know, keeping with tradition. Good time to be here. There's always something big that happens on Tuesdays. Had a big sell-off today, mainly fueled by uh, Powell's comments, <clears throat> Fed comments uh, regarding inflation, and it looks like they're going to take more aggressive measures to hike rates and uh, kind of win against market expectations, which were basically you know 25 basis point hikes moving forward and. Uh, although it, it's it's not confirmed and to be determined, but it looks like uh, there's a greater likelihood for 50 basis point hikes, you know, in the, in the near future, which spooked markets today caused caused it to sell off, and um, we'll we'll take a look at that, how it's impacting markets, how it will likely impact markets, you know, in the near term moving forward through this week. Um, so a lot. Of, a lot of important things to take a look at tonight, um, and we'll look at those in the context of our uh, key levels on the major indices, map those out, take a look at volatility in the VIX, uh, the 36-month moving average on the S&Ps, um, and then our strategy topic for tonight is uh, we, we've had a lot of requests for um, you know, digging deeper into finding oppor you know, opportunities with signals and uh, specifically within our Zillion platform. Um, so we're going to look at combining uh, momentum uh, signals with divergent signals tonight and actually look for some current opportunities as they relate to uh, current market conditions. So that's that's our topic tonight. And hopefully we'll find some good, good stuff that will help you guys out for this week. Um, and then uh, I, know, I don't think we got to tick a roundtable last week uh, ran out of time. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time for that tonight. Um, 
If not, we'll definitely allocate more next Tuesday uh, to take a round table, but do our best there um, and then wrap up with our, our Q&A session. So um, again, welcome everyone. Looks like we got a nice group on tonight and a lot of important things to go over. So let's go over to our charts and we'll start out taking a look at the S&P. Um, let's see here, make sure we got our current data, which we do. All right, March 7th, uh, you know, again, big sell-off. So we had, um, we had kind of a mini slingshot here last week. And I'll uh, notate that here on the chart. And volatility expansion, right? So we had previously had a run-up in the markets and volatility contraction which is inevitably followed by volatility expansion that we saw last week. Uh, then we got a, uh, later last week, got a significant rebound right into uh, our, our center band, our average, where we often, uh, following a, a sell-off, find a stat or a dynamic resistance. And, the, the key here that could have, uh, you know, if you weren't prepared for this, alerted you to a, a potential rotation lower off of a catalyst like we saw today with Powell's comments was, again, the volatility expansion. So our outer volatility bands diverging. And for any of you who are, are new tonight and not in... Um, uh, or not, haven't attended previous, you know, sessions. Um, these are the Bollinger Bands. So we're looking at two standard deviation bands, which is typically the default setting on the Bollinger Band indicator. And uh, the, when they're diverging and price is moving lower and particularly trailing the lower band, um, that's uh, you know, a situation where there's higher risk of an acceleration of a market sell-off. Um, but with that in mind, there's certainly the the possibility of a retracement back to the upside or uh, a near-term rebound, which is again what we saw last week. And w if and when that occurs, as as it obviously did here, we want to exercise caution and really keep an eye on price action around that center band in the event of a rebound into that average. So what I'm looking for is um, the, the, the slope of the band. So when we were in an uptrend in January and eventually rolled over to the downside in February, that center band, which is our average price. It's a 20 period average price. Uh, transition from a strong upward sloping direction to a downward sloping direction. And in that case, after we've already had a market sell off, of course, and we have a downward sloping average, um, that very frequently will serve as dynamic resistance. And yesterday's trading on Monday, we saw the price action to confirm that. So you'll notice that we had a, a run up in the S and P yesterday, albeit you know not very significant in terms of range. It was reversed by bearish sell side market activity that caused a lower close off the open and a you know bearish price action. Um, which also coincided with the half century mark, 4050. So again, for those of you who are new, we very closely monitor uh, this type of price, price action in the context of key horizontal levels at what we call century marks or half century marks or quarter century marks. So uh, a half century mark, in this case, at 4050. Um, a century mark would be 4100, 4200, quarter century like 4025. So this is where, as we've discussed in past weeks, confluence becomes critical when we see 
uh, this type of price action around key critical, you know, uh, critical uh, key horizontal levels that uh, coincide with dynamic resistance being our, our center band that's downward sloping. Any catalyst, um, and today there it wasn't a minor one, it was, but it also, I guess if you look at it, kind of put it in context, it wasn't a major one. There's no guarantee of a 50 basis point rate hike from the Fed in the future. So this is a this is a fear-based sell-off. It was more, you know, there were comments from Fed Chairman Powell that was the catalyst behind this. Um, and so what I'm emphasizing is that when you get a catalyst, regardless of the significance of that catalyst, and it, it occurs near a key a static horizontal or dynamic uh, resistance, or, or could be support level. In this case, we're talking about uh, market sell-off. Um, so we're looking at resistance. Um, then you're likely going to see a, a more dramatic directional move, which is, of course, what we saw today with the S&Ps uh, closing down a uh, little over the uh, 1.5%. So there was very, you know, we knew that, that, that Powell was going to release these statements today. Um, and there was a lot of really good warning behind this, if you know how to look for it. Um, not just with, uh, you know, uh, the knowledge of, of, uh, the fed statements today, but, um, also the price action that occurred yesterday. Um, so for me, so I was, you know, prepared for this. And what, what I did is I, when I saw this, um, bearish price action around, uh, the, the 20 period average yesterday, um, and it coincided with half century mark resistance and the center band. I set sell stop orders, <clears throat> which are basically if the market comes down below uh, the the low from yesterday from this uh, candle here on Monday. <clears throat> I, sh I I was set up to short. E mini uh, S and P and Nasdaq features, which which I I did, and um, was able to take advantage of today's move to the downside, and we're going to use that that methodology <clears throat> today as we look at using you know analyzing momentum, scanning for momentum, um, as well as divergence. Um, so as far as key horizontal levels, so we we've obviously encountered a key. Uh, uh, dynamic resistance level, which is our downward sloping center band. <clears throat> and again, just to recap, whenever you see price come up into a downward sloping band, watch for resistance there. Next, look for uh, confluence with uh, half century, quarter century, half century, or century mark levels on the S and P. In this case, uh, forty fifty. Um. To add to the bearishness here, the, the bearish reaction to Powell's comments today, we also had a close below, below a millennial mark, so 4,000. So we closed at 39.86, and we didn't just close slightly below, we closed you know, almost 14 points below a key millennial mark, 4,000. So now, this is what I'm watching. I'm, I'm going to zoom in here. So see it a little bit better but for this week and particularly tomorrow i'm looking to see if s p stay up below four thousand so if this sell-off accelerates we'll very likely see a test of the two standard deviation move the lower band um potentially this week in fact we'll look at the prob probabilities of, of touching that which, by the way, we, we had a, a question from one of our very loyal uh, members um, who I'm not sure if he's on tonight, Manchu. Um, to recap a bit of what we talked about last week with uh, using probability of touching as part of you know, planning our trades, 
So I'm going to, I am going to um, go back into that a little bit, recap and give kind of some step-by-step, uh, -step, uh, I guess, I mean, it, the, the challenge with it is it's variable depending on what type of strategy we're applying it to, but I'll, I'll do my best to kind of give a, a universal step-by-step -step, um, process for using probability of touching um, to help, you know, plan and manage our trade, our, our trades. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Um, so, but we're looking at about 3,900, uh, which is a century mark on the S&Ps, coincides with our two standard deviation lower band, and currently we're moving towards that. So uh, as far as my, you know, in terms of my technical analysis and then also incorporating uh, Fed statements today and market reaction, uh, the the greater likelihood uh, points to a continu uh, continuation of the sell-off into, uh, or at least closer in, in the direction of the uh, two standard deviation lower band, uh, which is a dynamic uh, variable. So uh, that band, you know, moves obviously day to day. Um, Let's see, currently it's just a bit above the 3,900 century mark. So uh, on the close today, the lower uh, Bollinger Band is at 3,914.28. So very close to that 3,900 century mark. So that's the, the major area of support I'm watching. And then again, 4,000 on the s and is the major area of resistance that I'm watching uh, for this week. Oh, don't want to use that one. Okay, so this is 4,000 resistance, which of course was uh, broken today on the close and then 3,900 support. All right. Uh, and also again, for, for those of you who might be newer, um, in terms of interpreting this, if we break a resistance level that was support prior to breaking the level and closing below it, um, our expectation is a move into the next support level or vice versa. If we break a resistance level uh, to the upside, um, that becomes support. And our expectation is a greater likelihood for a move into the next resistance level. <clears throat> All right, so th those are really the ones I would keep an eye on for, for this week. And, and in particular, it's tomorrow as it relates to 4,000 on the S&P. Um, so let's, uh, while we're on the S&P, let's actually look at the uh, monthly uh, chart. So this is a monthly chart of the S&Ps uh, where we continue to kind of really spend a lot of time around the, the blue line here, which is a 36 period moving average, um, which historically serves as strong support for the major indices. And in this case, is the S and P's right? So, um, for for March, and we're only a week into the month, and and had a close in February uh, above the thirty six uh, period moving average. I'm really watching this in March because it's in play. We've actually already breached it to the downside. Uh, currently, uh, thirty six. Month moving average is at 39.48, which actually, um, let's see. Yeah, it's it's still a ways off from the 20% uh, trough as it relates to the to the peak uh, high of the S and P uh, back in early 2022, um, but it's not not really far out of the vicinity of um, bear market territory. So we're still we're still out of technical bear market territory on the S&Ps, but um, due to the, the close proximity of that level, which resides around 38.59, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really watching this zone between roughly 38.50 and 39.50. And, and, you know, looking to see uh, 
uh, as it relates to the month, month of March, like where are we going to close uh, in March relative to the 36 period moving average or the 36 month moving average? Because we're looking at a monthly chart. Um, and, and that will likely give us, again, clearer direction, um, depending on the magnitude of the close relative to the highs and lows of the month um, of direction and keep moving into Q2. Um, so we're kind of just right there at the moment. Uh, and let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100. So we'll uh, look at the QQQ. Um, and draw our levels. So uh, just like the S&Ps, we had uh, volatility contraction run up in prices, roll over in our center band and downward sloping center band. And yesterday uh, we found uh, we got quite a bit more above that center band uh, on Monday's trading, but uh, closed right at that dynamic resistance level, which coincides with a horizontal static century mark at 300 on the queues and uh, rotated lower off of that. All right, just like the S&Ps. Um, so not a whole lot of difference here in terms of uh, general analysis on, on the queues relative to the S&Ps. Um, it looks like uh, we don't have quite the volatility expansion, interestingly, on the NASDAQ. It's usually the other way around. We get uh, higher volatility and, and percentage moves on uh, the tech sector on the NASDAQ than we do on the S&Ps. And interestingly, in this case, we've got uh, more volatility contraction uh, with the standard deviation, deviation bands like converging, or at least the lower band is flat and the upper band is converging towards the lower band, which is kind of interesting and counterintuitive, but um, you know that's what's in the, in the context of this uh, sell-off today, but that's what's happening. Um, so we don't have quite the volatility expansion on the Qs that we do on the S&P, um, but the S&Ps are really like, you know, the mother product. Like that's the one I'm really am looking at. The S&Ps tend to have less like um, irrational behavior behind a lot of those, uh, these market reactions. Um, whereas, you know, tech sector uh, tends to kind of overreact uh, as it relates to price action. So um, I'm still looking at these in the context of the other indices, but um, for, for this week, keep a close eye on 300 as resistance. And um, right around kind of the 297 level also, because that was broken today. Uh, on the close, we're at 296.34. Um, and for tomorrow, really, you know, as it relates to tech watch, that, you know, roughly 297 level um, to see if we retest 300 or continue lower. And if, if we do continue lower, just like with the S&Ps, I expect greater, much greater likelihood of a two standard deviation move which currently resides around 288 on the queues. All right, so those are, and that would be support. So those are the key levels on the queues to watch for tomorrow and the rest of the week. Um, so lastly, let's take a look at the VIX. And of course we've got a, a bit of a VIX spike today on the sell-off off of a support level. So if you look at uh, 2023, so going back to the start of this year, right around 18, kind of this 18 and 19 zone has been uh, our, our support zone on the VIX for, for 2023 where historically as, as we've encountered this support zone, we've seen VIX spikes. We haven't seen any real extreme VIX spikes, which you know is more on the 
neutral to bullish sentiment of the market. But once again, you know, we we come down into this into this uh, 18 to 19 support zone and we get another big spike. So in the context of what we just looked at on the S&P and the NASDAQ, what I'm watching on the VIX, uh, particularly for tomorrow, because we kind of had the, you know, Powell made his, his comments and now people are fearing uh, more aggressive rate hikes and um, inflation may not have been on, you know, as much under control as we had hoped and all these things. Um, now, if that fear is kind of passed and, and uh, you know, we, we move back up into which, what's now resistance on the S&P and the NASDAQ, those levels we just looked at, um, then, you know, that's probably going to put us more into a neutral to uncertain market condition. But what I'm really keeping an eye on for tomorrow is the 20 level on the VIX. So if we have a continuation of the sell-off tomorrow that we saw today, we're going to see the VIX spike again. And if it spikes above 20, uh, and more so, not just spikes above 20, but closes above 20 tomorrow, that's my, in, you know, my clue that uh, that those moves that I that I talked about into the two standard deviation band, the lower Bollinger band on the Nasdaq and the S and P, um, are going to be much more likely to be, uh, you know, retested. Um, so, so again, the two things I'm watching is the VIX going to uh, move up above twenty tomorrow, and is it and if it does, is it going to close above twenty? So a spike above 20 and a reversal back below. So if we got like a, you know, a bearish candle, or let's say like just hypothetically, we go up into like 21 and, you know, we close back below um, the 20 level. That would be kind of a fake out sell off tomorrow following today's price action. But Conversely, if we if we um, spike above twenty tomorrow and close above it, then I'm going to be prepared for uh, that that uh, that sell off to accelerate into that two standard deviation band, those support levels we just looked at on the S and P and the Nasdaq. Okay, so that's that's how I'm using these levels this week um, and making you know what I'm using to make my tr uh, near term trade decisions and and uh, manage any open trades I have. Um, using S and P's, Nasdaq, and uh, the VIX. Uh, so, um, real quick, I'm going to look at. I said I would look at the probability of touching uh, that 3,900 century support on the on the S and P. So let's look at that, and then we'll open it up to any questions. Um, so if we go to Friday's expiration, which is the 10th, I believe, <clears throat> and we're going to look, and this is actually something we covered. Um, just recently, uh, well, last week actually, right? So, uh, using probability of touch, and and we'll look at this uh, in the context of the thirty nine hundred level on the S and P, and then open it up to questions. And then before we get into tonight's topic, to, to tonight's topic, I'm going to uh, really quickly recap from last week uh, because again, we had a, a really good member question, kind of how to again, uh, you know, incorporate this probability of touching a price, um, which we can, is, is information we can get for any optionable asset um, into, into a strategy, into our trade planning and trade management. Um, okay, so looking at 3,900 going out to Friday, this week's, ex, uh, Friday's expiration. Oops, sorry, 3,900. Um, we have a 28% purely based on mathematical probabilities of touching 2,900 between now and Friday over the next three trading days. Uh, my estimate is based on um, both fundam fundamental and technical factors um, that that probability is probably more in the range of like 40 to 50%. Um, so even, even in that case, um, I'm surprised it's not higher. 
but we want to keep an eye on this as well. So um, 3,900 is a key level on the S&Ps where if we were to close below it, um, that's not going to be, you know, good for the bulls as it relates to um, near to medium term directional movement. Um, so again, why I'm watching this 3,900 level on the S&Ps um, and keeping an eye because this is a, this is a moving uh, statistic. It's based on, in fact, you'll see it move intraday, but it's based on today's close. Uh, and is, so I, I monitor it uh, not just throughout the day, but uh, more so on a closing basis each trading day to see how it's moving. So if I see this prob, you know, if I see the markets continue to rotate lower tomorrow, and I see the probability of touching 3,900 increase, um, then I'm using that, you know, information again in my trading decisions. Um, all right. So, uh, Richard, any questions uh, we want to address with our uh, key levels and market overview, and then we'll. Uh, recap last week's um, probability of touching process and then talk about uh, momentum and divergence. Hey, Jeff, Richard had to jump off, but uh, we okay. had an attendee, the futurist, asked, uh, going back to the S&P on the daily, uh, would you have considered taking that buy signal considering the technicals and possibly that shooting star that you saw from yesterday? Okay, so that was off the daily? Yes. Okay, then let me get back over to the daily chart. And that was the S and P five hundred, correct. All right. Um, okay, yeah. Good, uh, great question. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, this is one I would not take. Uh, again, reason I what I try to avoid is, um, and, and again, we'll get into this tonight as we talk about momentum and divergence. Um, we did have bullish divergence, but. It's been in play for a number of months, you know, going back to October of last year. Uh, and within the within that bullish divergence, which was a shift from bearish divergence again back in like earlier October, um, we're seeing significant downdrafts in the market. And um, like any other metric, like I don't use them as a standalone analytical tool. I, I look for confluence and, and combine the information to make the right decisions. Um, and the reason I don't like this buy signal is we just, um, you know, because it, it, it's the really the reason we start out from a top-down approach and analysis, you know, of the key levels, the broader indices, and then drill down into signals on individual securities is, you um, if I did my homework and I and I everything that we just looked at, which was our homework for today, right? Um, on the S and P, I know that I've got a key horizontal or static resistance area or zone, really, between a half century and a century mark, forty one hundred or forty fifty and forty one hundred, right? Which is where, of course, we saw the reversal. Um, and then I've got the dynamic resistance and a downward sloping average. So when I'm looking at this, I don't wanna just look, and, and I really hope this helps everybody, like for any decision-making in your trades, your trade planning, your trade management, because often, and, and I'm guilty of it too, we often just look at the current candle or maybe the last couple. But if you go back and really look at the structure of the trends and the price action, it gives us a much better picture. So if you look at trend movement, of course, we had a big uptrend. It's easy to spot in hindsight, right? Then we had a, a rotation lower. So this is how markets move. They move kind of in a zigzag fashion. So after we have a rotation lower into support. And again, these are things that we can have previously mapped out and been aware of ahead of time. So you can see prior support around this level where we had strong directional moves 
from around you know 3900 to 3950 well if we if we move from a, so that was a support level and this is again why it's so crucial to know where these levels are not just on the S&P and the Nasdaq and the Russell and major indices but on anything you're trading so we we can know that that support level was there now that doesn't mean a support level can't break or a resistance level can't break but last week we had a very strong indication of that support level holding and that was back on March 2nd we see the sell off into that level the level holding a strong close higher right um so markets move in a zigzag fashion so what's the expectation that we're going to move up into a resistance level there it was or a zone you know it might not be an exact level again if if you're relatively new tonight um we don't want to you know look at these numbers as an exact number um for those of you who who follow our teachings and you know join us regularly on the Tuesday sessions um these should be looked at as zones not exact levels um so you know for instance if we move up into 40 60 and rotate lower um it's not right off 40 50 but that's the half century mark zone um so it sometimes helps you know if you're uh, kind of starting you're new and you're starting to implement this methodology um to look at it more as a zone so um, it helps to use like half century mark to century mark zone so if we look at like 4050 to 4100 here where we had yesterday's reversal on the s and p's um see how they see how markets zigzag from these key levels um so i i kind of went on a tangent there but i think it was important because the reason I don't like this buy signal, because if I look at the bigger picture where we had run up, move up, or move, sorry, move down, move up, there were too many things working against this signal. Um, and that would again be the horizontal resistance zone, the dynamic resistance zone, downward sloping center band, um so there are certainly times that these types of signals can play out nicely uh and so if I were to you know try to play this from a bullish perspective to the long side I would have waited for price to close above this band which it never did not that alone would have kept me out of this signal which is still an open signal but um you know it's about midway between entry and stop loss and really could have been weeded out with um that type of that, that analysis so what i am looking for is signals like this where we're in volatility um upward sloping standard deviation and average um and we have room to run between our entry and our next key level of resistance century mark right there 4100 so then I've got you know a good 50 point move I could take advantage of because again we're we're breaking through support which then becomes resistance which resides Right around the quarter 40 25 quarter century mark <clears throat> right so i'm i'm not taking a trade in a resistance i'm taking one above resistance which now is support and i've got you know enough room to uh you know make a directional trade before i encounter more significant resistance um so these signals you know i'm moving in tandem with the market and and going in with the direction of you know the current this one um not the case and not to say it couldn't have worked out obviously in hindsight it's uh in a drawdown but 
this is where, as I mentioned, you know, when we were doing the market analysis, we're actually, I didn't use this signal and quite the opposite. I shorted the E-mini S&P and E-mini NASDAQ futures just based on uh, this price action of volatility expansion, retest of the center band, downward sloping, and placing uh, you know, sell stop orders uh, below the low. So if this was a, you know, a fake um, reversal off uh, dynamic resistance, then I wouldn't get in the trade. But if there was follow through, as of course there was today, that I'm short and we typically get really nice directional moves off of these, uh, these you know, uh, dynamic support and resistance areas. So, um, yeah, so again, we're going to look uh, tonight more at the, at the signals and how to interpret them and look at some current opportunities for this week, but, uh, sorry, that was kind of a long answer to that question, but, um, hopefully that helped out. Some good details right there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, I can't, I can't get it right now. Time. No others? No others right now. All right. So let's take a look. Um, so we're in the Zillion dashboard. Um, again, starting from kind of a high level overview. Oh, sorry. Actually, let's go back really quickly to probability of touching. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details just, you know, due to time constraints, but we have a recording from last Tuesday's session in the uh, ch YouTube channel. You guys can review that where we covered probability of touching. Um, and again, uh, one of our dear members, you know, requested that we kind of go into more detail on using that in the trade planning process, um, which we will incorporate more in our in our weekly sessions because it's such a valuable uh, tool for uh, not just planning our trade but managing it. Um, but uh, you know, try to do this fairly quickly. Um, and, and again, we'll get into uh, more detail on this and actually incorporate it into picking out trades and managing them um, in, in future weeks. But again, uh, probability of touching is provided. It's a it's a statistical metric, metric for options, optionable securities uh, provided in the options chain. So uh, again, last week, if you weren't in attendance, you can review the recording. And if you, your broker doesn't provide this uh, statistic in your options chain, there's a very easy way uh, to, to determine it yourself without that. Uh, but in the Thinkorswim platform, you know, it's it's uh, one of the things that, that is provided. And again, we went over last week how to add that to your options chain. Um, so that's the column you see here that I uh, emphasized uh, on the S&P. Uh, and I just went out to the monthly expiration, the March 17th, third Friday of the month. Um, and if we were setting up, you know, or, or planning a trade, um, the way we would want to use probability of touching is going to be variable based on our trade strategy and our directional bias. Uh, so if we're just to kind of give a basic um, framework for how to use this, if we're planning a bearish trade, so uh, that could be a variety of option strategies or shorting a security. And again, we're using the S&P for example purposes. This can be applied to any optionable stock or ETF or any you know futures market, anything that has options uh, available. Um, if we're bearish and we want to take a you know a, a directional bias to the downside, um, one of the thing first things I look at is probability of touching a, a price because before I enter a trade, I want to have an exit plan. So if I short or if I set up a bearish, you know, uh, vertical put debit spread or a bear call debit spread, whatever it is, I want to know ahead of time before I get into the trade um, where um, I want to get out of it, right? What's my exit plan? And generally from that's going to be like a, a particular price, right? So another way to look at that is if I need, you know, if I set up a trade where I need 
the underlying asset to move to a certain price to produce a profit I'm looking for on an option spread or um, even just by shorting uh, the security, um, I need to know at least mathematically what my chances of su success of reaching that price are between when I enter the trade and the expiration date. So again, first step, select your time horizon, right? How much time are you willing to tie up capital? How much time are you willing to be in the trade and um, et cetera? Or if you have to make adjustments to it, you know, all those are, are considerations. Um, or maybe there's a, a an underlying catalyst, technical or fundamental that you're, you know, is causing you to enter this trade. Whatever those those things are, they're all, you know, obviously individual and personal. Um, based on that, select your expiration date. And uh, again, last week we talked about, it doesn't have to be one expiration date. You can look at multiple around that time horizon. And that's also beneficial. But once you select an expiration date and you have an idea of, for this trade to be successful, for it maybe to meet my risk reward tolerance, you know, I've done my technical analysis. I've placed my stop loss at a level where if, you know, the trade moves in the direction that I'm anticipating, I want to, I want it to, you know, double the, the risk I'm taking. So once you've, you know, determined those, those are really the first steps. Um, I look for the probability, you know, before I get into the trade, because maybe mathematically the probability is just way against me and I don't want to get into a low probability trade. Um, so again, just completely hypothetical. We're not going to go through all the, the other uh, nuances, but if I were, you know, bearish on the S&P and I, I set up a, a, a bearish trade and let's say, you know, I had, I, this is the short term trade. I have a time horizon of, you know, a week or two, I select the March 17th expiration nine days from now. And I, you know, whatever the, my strategy is, I, I need the S&P to move down you know, to 39.50 for that trade to meet all those things I just mentioned, right? So what I do is I look at that price, that strike price, and then I go over to the probability of touching column. And I see, well, statistically speaking, the S&P has a 78, a little over a 78% chance of touching 39.50 between now and March 17th, the next nine trading days, right? So if I set up a trade where I would uh, be successful and make you know make a profit on that trade if the S and P hits thirty nine fifty, then I know roughly, at least mathematically speaking, not factoring in you know uh, any other technical or fundamental uh, components, then I've got a, almost an eighty percent chance of having it you know work in my favor and making money on the trade. So it gives me a good kind of framework, uh, baseline, you know, um, a metric for for knowing my probability of success. Um, so that's that's kind of a step process. But we're really, and that's for a bearish trade. So if we're if we're you know setting up a bullish trade, in this bearish example, we use the put side of the spread. You know, if we're if we have a bullish directional bias and we expect the underlying security to move up we would use the call side of the spread, right? So if I'm bullish on the S&Ps and I set up a bullish option strategy or just, you know, buy shares, um, and I, in order for the trade to meet my, you know, risk reward expectations, so on and so forth, I need it to move up to 4050. If it doesn't hit that price, then um, I, I, it's probably a trade I don't want to take. So that's all predetermined. Um, so once I know that, you know, predetermined price, I can go look at probability of touching that. Oops, sorry. That's probability out of the money. Probability of touch is right here. It's 60%, right? So I only have a, you know, still better than a flip of the coin, but statistically speaking, I've got about a 60% chance of hitting 40, 50 between now and March 17th. So you can do that for multiple expirations, but that's kind of the step process. Um, but the key is you want to, it's variable um, based on your strategy. So that's kind of a, used, a way to use it for directional uh, trades. 
Um, but you could use it, for instance, um, for uh, like credit spread trades. So if you're familiar with credit spreads, you know, where you don't want the underlying asset to touch or breach a price between your entry date and your expiration date, you can also use it for that, right? So um, hopefully that kind of helps with the process. Um, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll use that quite a bit moving forward. Um, but uh, if there are any questions on that, Craig, uh, let's, let's go ahead and kind of talk, do some scanning and look at current opportunities for, night, for tonight. Uh, there's no questions uh, pertaining to that, no. Okay, and we will wrap up with Q&A here uh, after we kind of do some some searching together tonight. So what I wanted to do is really look at, look for, you know, we've kind of determined the market sentiment at this point, uh, market direction. We've done mapped out our key levels. Um, so I really want to, you know, also look at sector performance and run some scans to see, you know, to give you guys an idea of what, you know, might look good to me or might look bad. To me. So let's, let's uh, transition over to that. Um, and we're going to, again, we're in the zillion platform. Um, and market sentiment, you know, we're starting to see uh, it, it, it's, it's updated on a daily basis. So we're starting to see risk kind of tick up from the lower zone. Um, trend is starting to tick down. Right. And um, interestingly, we're seeing uh, a relatively high percentage of pending buy signals from our algorithms. But I'm watching this because I expect it, it, you know, it to also continue to uh, move in the uh, direction of more neutral to, to sell activity. Um, so sector performance, this is a really uh, valuable and if you're not a zillion user, you can you can find sector performance on you know other financial websites. Uh, we provide it uh, based on our own algorithms, which are described by clicking on the information icon here, um, that make it easy to see for the current day, like what the top and underperforming sectors are. So today, you know what I'm really paying attention to in the context of what we uh, talked about is we don't have any top performing sectors that are in positive territory. Um, and we have some significantly underperforming sectors, real estate being number one, uh, financials, and then consumer discretionary, okay? Um, and if you look at those negative numbers, again, if you uh, look here, anything four, minus four to minus 10 is strongly underperforming. So real estate is getting hammered, which is not surprising today, right? Because there's the fear of, uh, more aggressive rate hikes impacting the real estate market, right? Fewer people are going to want, you know, mortgage loans are going to get more expensive and fewer, fewer people are going to get mortgages and buy houses. As well as financials, right? Rates heavily impact financial sectors. So very good to know as my, in my trade planning, right? I want to know uh, when I'm start to do my scans and look for momentum and divergence, divergent based trades that I'm trading within the higher probability sectors of the directional bias that I have, which currently is bearish, right? So I have a bearish bias. And what I'm doing here is I'm really building up, you know, a case, a confluence of variables that line up to, to you know, tell the story of what's going to lead to me selecting, um, you know, trend momentum and divergent trades. So now that I've determined that, what I like to do is actually go within, you know, inside one of these sectors to look for signals. Um, so this is one of the things I really love about the Zillion platform is I can just click on one of these sectors and populate the symbols within that sector in my scanner. So just a click of the mouse, I can start looking for bearish opportunities in real estate and financials. So let's look at real estate because real estate really, you know, think back to like 08 when real estate market just got hammered due to the subprime, you know, subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, 
that's a, a risk that we're facing now with high inflation and higher rates um, after a pretty significant real estate bubble. So this is a good starting point for me. All right, so if I start looking within the real estate sector for bearish opportunities, of course, I'm going to want to look for sell signals. So the next thing I'm going to do is go to the sell signal column here and go to pending signals. Well, I don't currently have any pending signals within the real estate sector. Let's look at entered signals. Oh, maybe I have a filter on here. Oh, interesting. We actually do not have any active sell signals in the sector. Also, we don't have any bearish divergence. We have bullish divergence and buy signals from the previous run-up that are all open. So these uh, open signals, you know, when the real estate sector was uh, running up, in January and, and early February, uh, you can see like this is just the real estate uh, select sector spider ETF. Um, had some good buy signals. Um, we did have a, on the ETF at least, we had a sell signal at the top of this rotation that was really nice, but uh, hit the trailing stop at th right around 38.25 last week. Um, so right now there's no sell signals, but that's okay. So what what I do if there's no active signals in that align with my directional bias is um, I keep it on my I keep it on my radar and I look for you know I either add these to my watch list so um, I can create a new you know watch list for the week where I'll say you know uh, bearish uh, real estate. And done. Um, and then I'll show you what I do next here, where in this case where there's no active signals. And then we'll look at financials to see if we have any there. Um, so then what I would do next, and we actually don't have any, like I said, any bearish divergence, which is the next thing I look at. Um, but planning ahead and knowing um, the se you know directional sector performance and um, there aren't any signals. Those often lead to great opportunities. Um, so I want to keep it on my radar. So I, well, again, what I do, create the watch list, and then I'll use the stats, and I'll scan for profit factors greater than one. All right. So what this tells me is that on these, uh, on these assets within the real estate sector, um, going back five years. Our, our momentum and divergence signals are profitable. Okay, so that's the next step. So these are the ones I'm probably going to want to add to my watch list. They have positive profit factors. And that um, individually for each symbol can be found by toggling over to the, the statistics um, tab to the right of the chart tab. Okay, so these are good watch list symbols. So then once I add them to my watch list, um, I can keep an eye on those four cell signals, right? And red divergence cloud, all right? And to get those, uh, if you go under your um, your profile icon and collect, select trade alerts, you can actually set up email trade alerts for those as well. Um, or you can just come into the platform and check those, all right? Um, so, you know, just doing this in real time, obviously we there's, there's no signals. So um, that's how I would, would manage that and use it as a watch list tool um, to keep an eye out for any you know pending sell signals that might come up, for instance, tomorrow. All right, so nothing there. Um, so let's take a look at financials. Let's see if we've got any sells. Bearish divergence on Schwab and this is a really old sell signal. It must be doing really well on Citizens Financial. So this one came in back on February 7th. 
this thing's still open. So the entry was 43.56, stock closed today at 38.69. Um, so that's an open one. So there's just one open on financials. Interesting. We do have bearish divergence. So that's the next column here with the red column. So what I like to look for ideally, if the opportunity presents itself is a buy or a sell signal that aligns with the cloud divergence. So I'm looking for a sell signal that coincides with a red divergence cloud you see here on the chart, and then a buy signal that coincides with a bullish divergence cloud. Um, so currently there's, again, not any of those and no pending signals. Um, so once again, what do I do? I scan for profit factor. Actually, I had that filter on. Sorry, take that back. I had the uh, profit factor filter on there. So there is um, at least, let's see. Yes, nope. Uh, oh, we got four pending actually. And then entry. Yeah, we got those two. Yeah, sorry guys. That's uh, something to be careful of. Um, if you have a filter on, it's going to incorporate that into filtering other columns, which is what I just did. Um, so there actually are uh, four pending. So let's let's take a look at these. Um, nevertheless, if we uh, going back, um, for instance, like if we look at these and they're not opportunities we want to place trades on, um, we can still uh, add those. Uh, what I again, what I do, look at profit factor above uh, one and add those to my watch list for trade opportunities uh, that might come up in the in the subsequent days. So, um, but going back to these pendings, so we've got uh, m and Bank Corp. All right, so pending sell. So let's take a look at m and All right, uh, let's actually go back. I don't think there was any bearish divergence, but just wanna verify. Yeah, we don't have any bearish divergence here. Um, but it doesn't doesn't prevent me from taking a trade. So um, let's do a quick analysis on on M and T as it relates to the sell signal here. So we have um, here's here's what I'm looking at. Okay, so everything that we just ran through on the indices in terms of mapping out levels, that analysis, I run through that same exercise on what I'm trading. Right, so um, I'm looking for uh, key horizontal support and resistance. Uh, and if you just go back to December, there's obviously uh, resistance right around 150. A lot of times you'll see this horizontal resistance, support and resistance align with uh, key century mark levels. So that's right around 150, uh, which was broken today. Uh, so this was prior support and is now a resistance level due to today's rotation lower and close below. All right, the other thing that is significant here, and this is, again, uh, a topic we've covered in past weeks multiple times called our slingshot setup, is we've got prior uh, volatility uh, contraction slash stagnation. I mean, we... We had we had the run up in M and T in January February. We had the rotation in the lower two standard deviation band, the retest. And so, if you look at the outer two standard deviation bands, they're horizontal, right? And that's a contractionary period. So then, what I look for is expansion, which is diverging outer standard deviation bands. And in the case of a sell-off where price is trailing the lower band, my next step is to look at the center band. Is it rolling over? Was it in an uptrend and rolling over into a downtrend? So there's really three things here that we're looking to align. And th these are all, this is my thought process for whether I want to take this sell signal, okay? Um, you know, so one, are we in, we're, we're rotating lower, so are we in expansion, right? Volatility expansion. And yes, we have diverging outer bands. Um, is our average, our mean, 
uh, rotating higher to lower, yes. So we have um, downward sloping mean. Okay, so that checks. And it, at the same time that we have a downward sloping mean and uh, diverging two standard deviation bands and volatility, in other words, volatility expansion, is price touching or exceeding the lower band? We just do the opposite for a bullish move, but in this case, we have a sell signal. Well, yeah, we way exceeded the lower two standard deviation band today on the close, right? So we've got um, price right, is equal to or greater to the lower band, All right? Check, okay. Now I've got a pending sell signal. So the next thing I wanna do, and this is where we'd start looking at like probability of touching, for instance. If I were to set up a bearish trade on this, uh, this signal, I wanna know where my support is, right? Where might I encounter trouble on a bearish directional move? Well, I see some right around 145, but on today's close, we we're actually close below that. Not a lot, but 144.20 on the close. But if you look at prior support near this level, Right, it's it's historically served as support. So this is still kind of a wishy-washy support resistance level, but more resistance because we had a close on the day below the level. So that's the, the closest proximity support. I also see very strong support right around you know 138.75. So lows from December, January. Right, where we had sell off into the level and rotation higher. So if we continue to get a move lower, this would likely be if I get follow through and it moves in, in the anticipated direction of the downside where I want to look at my profit target level. So whether I short shares or set up a you know, a bearish put debit spread or a bear call credit spread, whatever it is. Um, and I get moving in the anticipated direction. I want to expect to either get out of the trade near this level or really watch it as it moves into that level for how price reacts. Do we reverse back up? Because then if this support level down here below 140 holds and we get bullish rotation higher, the likelihood is we're going to retest the resist this. 145 resistance level, right? So this could happen quite quickly, right? It's not that far away from current prices. So I'm, how do I use that information? I wanna maybe set up a pretty short-term trade on this, right? So that's where I could go out and I believe m and is an optionable security, right? And I can go over to my broker platform and I can pull up, let's see if it's, The chain for MNC Bank. Let's clear out our drawings there, right? And they, they don't have weekly expirations, just monthly. But if I think that I want to set a profit target, let's say um, at 135, what is the chance I'm going to get down? And that's actually quite a bit below. Um, this is actually a good example of what to do if the strike doesn't coincide with your profit target level for us would be really closer to 140. So we can either use the 140 level or we can take an average between the two strikes. So we're just, our profit target, you know, on a continuation of the sell-off would be just a bit under 140, which has mathematically about a 43.23% a chance of being reached in the next 10 days, right? So. I would probably give that more of like a 60% chance based on 
bearish price action and our momentum sell signal, right? Which again is right here. <clears throat> All right, so if I feel like I can get a good risk reward on that type of a setup, then what I need to do, because we don't wanna just jump on this in on this uh, you know directional move from this one signal because it's a pending, right? We looked up pending signals here um, that hasn't reached the, the entry price. So then what I do is I look, what is my, uh, my uh, momentum entry price? Well, it's 143.46, which should be just a little bit below the, the, uh, today's low. 143.70, it was today's low, right? Um, so what I can do is use a sell, if I wanna take a short trade off of this, or if I'm, uh, this again is something we've covered in, in previous weeks. If I wanna um, uh, set up an option strategy, we can use contingent options orders. Uh, but whatever asset class I'm using or, or, or method I'm using, um, I only want to enter the trade if price comes down into that level, right? The 143.46 price. Uh, that way, tomorrow, if, you know, we, we all of a sudden get a rotation back to the upside and we don't come down below uh, today's low, it keeps me out of that trade. Okay, so that's why this is a pending signal. Um, so if we come down into that 143.46 uh, level and I want to take a position off of that, um, I can set up that order, right? Sell so stuff. Um, so this is uh, a, a setup that meets my criteria in general, right? Like, I'm not saying I'm going to take this trade. I'm just telling you this is the confluence I'm looking for and uh, aligns with a lot of the factors that I'm looking at. The, the horizontal levels, making sure I'm not trading in the case of a short setup into support, right? We just got through support here. And if I place my sell stop uh, below today's low, um, then I have a higher probability of coming down into uh, the 140 level. Um, and then we've got diverging volatility, right? So we have our outer bands moving away, which indicates an you know accelerating sell-off uh, and tends to, you know, if you look at past, here's a good example. Right, volatility contraction, volatility expansion. Right, here's another example. If you look at these outer bands, tends to result in fairly significant directional moves. Um, so that's why you want to look for those factors to align. Because like here, price touched the lower band, but we didn't have the volatility contraction or expansion. Sorry, in fact, we had contraction. Right, the bands weren't diverging. So you really want to look for these diverging bands, right? For indication of, of, of that volatility expansion. And then as well as the lower sloping um, center band, our mean, All right? So uh, this is a, to me, a valid sell signal, right? Uh, if I were to, if I were searching for opportunities uh, within a bearish sector, financials, that's a valid sell signal, right? That meets my criteria. There was things I didn't look at, like um, risk reward, what strategy I'm going to incorporate, and does it, you know, make sense from a risk reward perspective? All of those types of things, which again we've covered in other sessions, so we need to also look at those. But from a technical perspective, um, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so then I would just simply go and do the same thing here for the other pending signals, right? Um, do I have and see this one? I don't like as much, right? Because it's a sell signal. Um, we just had a nice sell signal off of a, a upward bullish slingshot, but this one's really into a support level. So I don't have enough directional movement before I encounter support. So that immediately weeds that one out for me. Um, now this one I like better on Synchrony Financial, right? Because we're earlier in the stages of potential volatility expansion, right? Um, I've got some room before I encounter support. So I'm not trading right into a support level, at least that I can immediately see here. Um, and it and it meets the criteria. All right. So maybe if I take a trade based on price reaching 34.49. And lastly, let's see here on Jeffrey's financial group. Okay, so this one's moved a little bit further. Oh, 
but we've broken a, a key support level. I do want to look at this swing point here because we had a uh, strong resistance there. If you look at the the pivot off roughly that 36 level and then strong sell off. So there were a lot of sellers at that level for whatever reason. Um, we're kind of right around there here. But if we can clear that and get down into our entry price, um, also, you know, we've got the volatility expansion, the the uh, rotating upward to lower uh, trend line. And if we can get down below, we've got significant room till our next key support level, which is right around 34. Um, so again, with confirmation and assuming it meets other risk reward criteria, et cetera, uh, also might be an opportunity within the bearish financial sector. So that's kind of my process. Again, um, please also review other weekly videos to get more in-depth analysis of like trade planning, risk reward, strategy selection, all of those types of things. Um, and Craig put that, uh, looks like he put the YouTube uh, channel address in the chat box for you guys. Um, so we we definitely ran over tonight uh, and and we had a lot to cover, you know, considering uh, what's going on in the markets this week. So I uh, appreciate you guys bearing with me and, and sticking through it. I, I think I'm, I'm hopeful it'll help you guys navigate markets this week and help with your trade planning and trade management. Um, so we'll we'll hold a ticker roundtable off till uh, next Tuesday. Uh, but uh, if there are any questions to wrap up, Craig, if you want to relay those to me, I'd be happy to answer anything that's come through. Thanks, William. Appreciate it. Uh, I don't see any questions. I uh, see quite a few eager people looking forward to Ticker Roundtable next week. So uh, I'll have to make sure to get to those people next week. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, I say that a lot, I know. But um, now that we've missed it two weeks in a row, we're going to allocate more time to that next week. Uh, maybe even just do a dedicated session to look at uh, next week what you guys want to look at. We covered so much in the uh, you know previous weeks that uh, I'd like to really start applying it more to uh, what you, you guys are watching or interested in potentially trading. So let's uh, plan on that for next Tuesday. Uh, so come prepared for, you know, any any stocks or ETFs or other markets you guys want to look at. Happy to do that. So um, thanks for all the great comments, guys. Uh, really appreciate it. And the recording will be uh, up in the YouTube channel uh, uh, sometime in the next like 24 to 48 hours. If you're, if you're a current member, it'll be up in the uh, members area tomorrow, uh, tonight or tomorrow. Um, so uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, does that wrap it up, Craig? Yeah, it sure does. Great. All righty. Well, um, once again, wish you guys success in the markets this week. Um, if you do have questions after tonight's session, you can uh, shoot us an email, support at altostrading.com. And uh, we'll plan on seeing you guys all next Tuesday. Have a great rest of the week.